Today I'm reacting to another video from the Armchair Historian. Please go check out his channel. He has a lot of great content. This is How Did Italy Fail to Invade Greece? This should be a good one. This is all about the Greco-Italian War in World War II. Let's get to it. In early October 1940, the chief of the Italian general staff, Pietro Bedolio, was ordered by Mussolini to begin preparing for the invasion of Greece. And on the 28th, using the recently annexed Albania as a base, the Italian vanguard of two divisions advanced into the Pindus Mountains. From the outset, progress was slower than anticipated, and within 11 days, the Greeks had stopped the invasion dead in its tracks. And to make matters worse, the Italian logistical system collapsed. By the 14th of November, the Greeks had pushed the Italians back to the border and began a unified counteroffensive, which shattered the Italian line and threw them into a panic. In some places, the Greeks penetrated as far as 50 kilometers or 31 miles into Albania. The counteroffensive only ended after the Greeks lost momentum and a stalemate then ensued, which would only be broken in April by the Germans. This leads us to today's question. How did the Greeks manage to repel an invasion by a seemingly much stronger power? So the title of the video is How Did Italy Fail to Invade Greece? And in all honesty, Italy was successful in invading Greece. What they couldn't do though was to conquer Greece. That is the key. Hi, I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian. As we've seen in previous videos, Benito Mussolini's aspirations to recreate the Roman Empire were hindered by the poor performance of the Italian military in the Second World War. And this was just one major reason why Italy was more or less reduced to a German client state as the conflict continued. More so than in any other campaign, the Italian invasion of Greece, which ended with a bailout from the Germans, cemented this dependent relationship. In many ways, Italy's invasion of Greece was an attempt to imitate the expansionist policies of their German ally. Up to this point, Italy's only conquests had been in Ethiopia and Albania, while Italian participation in the Second World War had been limited to the French Alps and North Africa. But Mussolini was a man of boundless ambition, and had become convinced that the fastest method of securing dominance over the Mediterranean lay in the annexation of Greece. From the outset, Italian logistics and maneuverability were compromised by the harsh climate of the Pindus Mountains, combined with an unusually cold winter. By December, conditions were nearly arctic, foreshadowing what was in store for their German allies one year later. Pack animals quickly began dying of hypothermia, and tens of thousands of men on both sides developed frostbite. But these were not insurmountable obstacles, and the hardy Italians were no strangers to bad weather or rough terrain. They also possessed a substantial number of tanks, modern infantry weapons, and a strong air corps. In contrast, the majority of Greek troops had to make do with a truly archaic arsenal, consisting mostly of equipment left over from the Great War. Furthermore, the Axis stranglehold over Europe cut them off from ships of ammunition or spare parts. In terms of air power, the only force the Greeks could muster consisted of a mere 79 planes. Yet despite their advantages, the Italians would soon find that the armor, which had proved instrumental in the deserts of Ethiopia, were useless in the Pindus Mountains. Meanwhile, the air force that had terrorized the Republicans in the Spanish Civil War would be given a harsh lesson in humility by the British RAF, which flew many sorties in defense of Greek airspace from the island of Crete during the invasion. The British were also able to supply the Greeks with accurate and reliable intelligence on enemy troop movements and strategic objectives, thanks to having cracked Italian military encryption protocols. The character of the Italian military establishment was also a major contributor to the disaster. A culture of mistrust created bitter personal feuds in which generals were more concerned with humiliating each other than they were with defeating the enemy. Inter-service rivalries were just as severe, with each branch cooperating as little as possible out of fear that doing so would undermine their own political relevance. This was not helped by internal competition for the limited resources they had to work with. 
as Italy was a largely agrarian country, which unlike Germany did not have large occupied territories to plunder. These issues prevented the use of the combined arms tactics that their German allies had used so successfully in France and in Poland. Italian generals were also astonishingly unwilling to consider new tactics, preferring instead to believe that properly motivated and equipped infantry units could accomplish anything in sufficient numbers. This attitude was highlighted when Italian observers compiled a detailed and insightful report on German tactics and handed it to Chief of Staff Badoglio, only for him to promptly dismiss it with the words, we'll study it when the war is over. I think we can all agree that throughout the course of history, many battles and wars have been lost by arrogant leaders. But contrary to popular perception, the Italian army was not wholly incompetent. The issue did not lie with the morale or training of the average soldier, but instead lay in the systemic failures of the military establishment as a whole. It was a leadership problem. Even Erwin Rommel noted that when given proper leadership, the Italian troops under his command displayed incredible bravery. But this quote from the war diary of a disgruntled Italian general underlines the lack of foresight or strategic planning that went in to the campaign. Someone will say in 15 days we must be ready to march against Yugoslavia, or in eight days we will attack Greece from Albania, as easily as saying, let's have a cup of coffee. The Duce hasn't the least idea of the differences between preparing war on flat terrain or in mountains, in summer or in winter. Still, less does he worry about the fact that we lack weapons, ammunition, equipment, animals, raw materials. The factors we've discussed so far, though important, were not enough to guarantee an Italian failure. That was guaranteed by the resolve displayed by the Greek people. Before the war, Greece was a nation suffering from many internal divisions. Prime Minister Ioannis Metexas had been a veteran of the Great War, who had taken to politics after becoming alarmed by the growing communist movement among the Greek peasantry. But after failing to secure popular support, Metexas was appointed prime minister by the king of Greece, George II. Shortly thereafter, Metexas used the threat of a communist uprising to abolish parliament and establish himself as an authoritarian dictator. I just want to read that blurb out to you guys, since you probably can't see it on the screen. Between 1924 and 1936, the Greek government changed a staggering 23 times, and the country endured no less than 13 different coups. I've never heard of a country having that many coups, especially in a time period of what, about 12 years? ...to abolish parliament and establish himself as an authoritarian dictator. But despite the fact that his regime was deeply unpopular, the Texas was a genius propagandist whose total control over the Greek media allowed him to spin a narrative of Italian cowardice and incompetence. Then on August 15th, weeks before the declaration of war, an Italian submarine torpedoed a Greek light cruiser. This coincided with a major festival to the Virgin Mary, and the pious Greeks reacted by elevating the deceased crew to the status of religious martyrs. Metexas could not have wished for a more perfect opportunity, and the state propaganda machines went into overdrive, whipping the nation into a patriotic frenzy for the coming righteous conflict against the vile Italian oppressors. The subsequent tenacity with which the Greeks resisted invasion was seen on numerous occasions, such as the Battle of Hill 731, in which an entire Italian division, supported by an armored element, was repeatedly repulsed by a single battalion of Greeks defending an important mountain pass. This act of heroism has often been called the modern Thermopylae, and ultimately caused the Italian Spring Offensive to be canceled. The defenders of that hill faced one of the worst artillery barrages in modern history. The hill got its name from its height. It was 731 meters. Well, after this battle, it had actually gone down to about 727 meters. I can't imagine the nightmare that those soldiers experienced during that arty barrage. 
Yet despite their numerous successes, the Greeks were ultimately doomed by factors beyond their control. Even with British aid, their army had effectively run out of supplies by March of 1941. War materiel captured from the retreating Italians provided only a temporary solution. And by the time the Germans invaded, the Wehrmacht faced an enemy that barely had enough ammunition for a month of sustained fighting. In total, at least 250,000 Greek reservists never even saw combat, as their country lacked the means to provide them with so much as a pair of boots. As the mainland collapsed, the government withdrew to the island of Crete, one of the last targets of the German Balkan campaign. British, Greek, and Anzac forces would be tested against over 20,000 airborne troops in the largest airborne invasion up to that point. Even though Germany won the Battle of Crete, it was still considered to be one of Germany's worst airborne failures. The people of Crete, just like the people of Greece, stood up and actually defended their homeland. And because of that, the Germans took out their vengeance on thousands of civilians. Hitler would go on to blame the invasions of Greece and Yugoslavia for the failure of Operation Barbarossa, Barbarossa. allegedly stating, if the Italians hadn't attacked Greece and needed our help, the war would have taken a different course. Barbarossa should have begun in May, but because Hitler had to divert troops to Greece, it got delayed about a month, which gave the Soviets two advantages. One, they had more time to prepare for an invasion, and two, it pushed the fighting into the winter months. And that's where Germany ran into problems because it was unprepared for the winter. While the Fuhrer may have been exaggerating, there is no doubt that the conflict in southern Europe was a significant drain on the limited resources of the Axis. Given all of the evidence discussed so far, it's easy to see how the Italian invasion was doomed from the start. Italian strategists ignored every lesson of modern warfare, pushing troops into battle with neither the equipment nor the support they needed to accomplish their mission. In the end, individual heroism could not compensate for the abject failures of the Italian military establishment. And even after Greece finally capitulated, its remaining soldiers took up arms in the British Army of North Africa, while many civilians fought as partisans, forming one of the strongest and most effective resistance movements of the war. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really enjoyed that video. And I just want to add a couple of things. First, this was the Allies' first victory of World War II. Second, Greek nationalism, which had been building since about the time of the Balkan Wars, played a huge role in why Greece was able to come together and actually defeat the Italians. Civilians even played a huge role. Women, children, and the elderly actually hiked up the mountains in freezing conditions to bring military supplies to the army. Then they actually carried the wounded soldiers down. My respect goes out to all the people of Hellas. If you want to watch another video on this war, then here you go. And as Winston Churchill said, Greeks do not fight like heroes. Heroes fight like Greeks.